May I have your attention? Please welcome TechCrunch senior climate reporter, Harry Weber, and Christine Tsai, founding partner and CEO, 500 Global. Welcome, so just a real quick note, this QR code allows you to ask a question. Uh, so we'll be taking questions through this QR code, ask away, um, and if it's a good question, I'll be, I'll be judging silently in the background. If it's a good question, uh, we'll certainly ask it, and hopefully we have time for everyone's questions. Um, but it's really easy, so take a picture of that, and it'll, the QR code will come up again in a bit. Um, so just to recap, my name is Harry, I'm a senior writer at TechCrunch, I cover uh, a lot of topics, including climate change and venture capital, which intersect, and, and it's an interesting combination. But um, I'm uh, just super excited to be here to talk with you, Christine. Um, obviously, you run 500 Global. I have some numbers here. $2.8 billion in assets under management. Uh, 2.6, or yeah, 2,600 uh, companies. Is, are those figures still accurate? Roughly, yes. Roughly, yeah, roughly accurate. Um, so, so, all right, so you run 500, um, you were also at Google, right? That's correct. Um, I, I also saw you were, uh, very briefly an intern at Chevron and I was just curious, okay. <laughs> I was just curious, uh, did you go in and then you're like, oh no, I got to get out of this. I, I was just curious. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's so long ago. Oh, uh, so that was, I, I think I was a summer intern while I was at Cal. And this is the late 90s, early 2000s. Sure. So my memory of that is, is pretty fuzzy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I just I saw it. I don't I know go, what I did. I go, hey, what's, what's up with that? Oh, but, a, but it's just curious. very random. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, we take these paths to get to where we are now. Um, and and it, it sure seems like 500 Global is doing well. Um, I wanted to ask, um, 500 really built its name as an accelerator. Mm -hmm. and in the early days, and it was sort of synonymous with, an ex with ex accelerators. Mm -hmm. um, but it's grown a lot since then. A lot's changed, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you've been backing larger stage companies. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Late, so, rather later stage companies is what I meant, but please company, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, no, definitely. I think so when, when we, so 500 was uh, started, we started 500 in 2010. And I think that was probably actually the last time I was here at Moscone West because we had Google, the Google I.O. conference, so it's a very fun place to be. Um, I remember running through these halls uh, back when I was at Google. And you um, ran that conference, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's nice to be back here. But uh, we, you know, we really started in 2010, which if you remember, venture was such a different, it was, we were in such a different point in time in that, in that period of time. So uh, our thesis was largely around betting on Seed stage, uh, seed stage companies needing less capital, but more help in terms of mentorship, um, running uh, experiments on the distribution platforms that I worked on back in the day at Google and YouTube that were starting to emerge. If you remember, the iPhone had just recently come out. So all of these platforms that we know today, and of course, um, are now nowadays a lot more under fire, um, those were emerging at that time. So we were really focusing on the early stage, the term pre-seed didn't exist, um, really helping these companies and building a large diversified portfolio, which is the 2,600 companies and growing that you mentioned. Um, now, 500, where we are today, 500 Global and looking out into the future is we have this, basically this infrastructure that we've built globally. That's something that we have invested in for the past 12 years. And now we're really leaning in such that we can not only continue to back founders all around the world in both mature and emerging markets, but also expand our own scope. So we continue to back the early stage, that's our bread and butter, but also expand to follow the founder journey to series A, series B, later stage, all the way through pre-IPO. Um, and that's something that we're really starting to build our muscles in and expand into so we can be more of like a multi-stage venture firm. And that's, that's both for the companies that you, you get in early, but also perhaps some companies that you haven't be, hadn't been in before that were much larger. Is that true? Backing some, some outside firms that are larger. 
Our focus is more on the companies that we've established that relationship with sure. because I think that's where we can really understand the company and, and keep, supporting them, uh, keep supporting them all along the way. So to date, we haven't come into a company at pre-IPO stage. It's not, really, um, it's not really an expertise for us. It's really more all the companies that we um, maybe are the first institutional investor into and then follow the journey, hopefully all the way to, to, to later stage exit. Sure, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And so I imagine, and, and this is probably an understatement, you see a lot of deals crossing your desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it was 2.6 uh, or 2,600 2, companies, um, you know, many more founders than that uh, have been involved in the program. Um, how has that flow happened? How's that deal flow looked th this year? You know, are you seeing fewer deals cross your desk or, are you, are you, or fewer uh, or more deals cross your desk? Are you seeing like more applicants, fewer applicants? Just what is, what's it like just in general? I, I think generally that, I mean, over the years, of course, the, the number of founders or deal flow or applications, and we kind of look at it all across the board, it definitely has increased. Um, I think nowadays, especially with the markets uh, being in very volatile and just kind of what's going on this year and even over the course of the last couple of years, because, um, you know, there's no shortage of some kind of crisis happening. Um, we, we definitely still see a consistently high number of applications or founders looking to start companies. Um, you know, you typically would think that during hard times, people are, are obviously going to pull back, risk averse, but actually we find, and many investors will see, it's, it's a great time to, actually a great time to start a company in terms of, um, it's not going to be any easier, of course, but more the opportunity to build something that will um, be really game changing. And so that's been exciting for us as early stage investors to see what's being built during the, the hard times versus the, the frothier times. Sure, sure. Would you say that the applications, you were, you were saying they've grown? Yeah, I would say they've grown. Yeah, I would say they've grown. Um, and one of, the, one of the things for us is that we run um, you know, our global program as well as uh, as a global investor, we have a number of programs that are hyper-local. So we have a program in different regions, um, not every region, um, as well as just investing directly into these companies. So um, kind of our tentacles are pretty wide into different markets. Would you rather, uh, I, just a question I've been asking a few people since I got here, um, would you rather raise a seed or a Series A right now? If you could put on your founder hat. Um, <sighs> it, it, I, I just The point of the question is just to get an idea of, of because I imagine it's a sort of a different experience for people at, at different stages. I would probably rather raise a seed round right now. <laughs> I mean, one thing that we're finding is that with the, um, you're, everyone's probably hearing a lot about it's, it's going to be, it's hard to raise and all this like VC dry powder and yada yada. I mean, I think just on the, in, in, you know, in the trenches, at least what we're seeing with our own portfolio and, and beyond is that at the, at the different ends of the spectrum, it's, it's quite different in terms of um, th th how it's impacting them. But generally, the very early stage, pre-seed, seed, depending on, seed is pretty broad, I guess, but the earliest stage is, nobody is immune, but there may be a little bit less affected because there's not much there anyways. It's you know, a couple founders, they building product, they haven't hit product market fit, so nothing really changes per se. At the late stage, obviously, there's a lot of carnage, valuations being slashed, um, just a lot, of, a lot of stuff yeah. going on. But oftentimes, um, not always, but a lot of times these companies may, may have cash reserves or ability to get cash so that they keep going. It's really everyone in the middle, the Series A, Series B, I think they are actually dealing with the most uncertainty because they may have gotten to product market fit. They don't have the cash reserves typically like a, a unicorn later stage company. Sure. And many of them, especially just because of what um, the, uh, you know, how things have been over the last few years, they've always tried to push growth over profitability. I'm sure they get that advice from their investors and that's what investors are looking for. The very investors who maybe now they're a little bit, <laughs> yeah. little pulling back a little bit. Yeah. yeah, so it's definitely been harder for the, the Series A companies looking to raise Series B or the late seed companies looking to raise an A just because investors are being much more cautious. Has the, has the oh, sorry, was, I didn't want to interrupt you there, that but yeah. Um, has the VC founder power dynamic if you know, if there must be some dynamic there, um, and has it shifted this year? Has, does it look a little different? Because there there is some talk about like a buyer's market, seller's market. 
Um, for, a little, for a little bit, it was like, ah, we got to get term sheets real quick because we want to get in on this cool deal. This deal's so hot that we got to think real fast. We got to, has that, has, has that changed this year as the dynamic shifted? Uh, in general, I would say that in, in, in times where capital is more scarce and of course it's more of an investor friendly market in terms of getting more favorable economics. I will say though that for, there are still the, the quote hot companies and they're still, they're going to still be able to, to command whatever terms they want. Uh, maybe there's fewer of them because what is deemed as a hot company is, is getting, you know, dwindling a little bit. <laughs> um, but so I, I definitely have still seen that happen. But in, in general, though, you know, a lot of companies who uh, maybe were trying to raise at a certain valuation realize they just they can't command that or the companies that are in a much more dire straits are trying to raise bridge rounds and they're raising either flat or down rounds. So it it in some of those companies that may have happened anyway, but there's there's definitely more of that happening nowadays. Sure, sure. And what's so you mentioned there are still hot companies. Um, I'm not sure if you want to provide specific examples, but but what sectors are, are hot right now versus um, perhaps last year? So one example that I've heard is that fintech isn't, isn't as hot as it was. Blockchain isn't. Um, some areas like climate tech, plugging, plugging myself a little bit here, but some areas are, are feel still pretty or somewhat frothy because the crisis is so uh, present. Um, so I'm just curious. It, what are you seeing a lot of, or, or what do you think is is getting a lot of you know heat? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that there's some rhyme or reason to this, but you know, you mentioned blockchain or Web three. I mean, yeah, you would think that generally that sector is there's um, it's there's also a lot of um, uh, crypto winter or whatnot going on. But um, you know, I have seen some blockchain companies still raising at crazy amounts, um, and I'm guessing that's largely because they were probably very early and the founders have that pedigree they're able to raise. So there, there's still some uh, anomalies like that. But I do think that when, you know, when it comes to what's more interesting for investors, exactly like you said, it's, it's the companies that maybe are solving very hard problems. I've seen some of these with the, like AI or um, um, uh, AI or ML companies, um, certainly things that are in uh, sustainability, climate, um, and health is still obviously always going to be a problem and a big, big area to, to serve. And um, with fintech, I think there's certain aspects of fintech that are seeing a lot more um, pullback, like all the lending companies, buy now, pay later. Of course, uh, there's less interest in that. Um, but even with some of the fintech companies, especially just again from our vantage point, we see uh, a lot of these companies being built in emerging markets that are, th those, those issues are a lot uh, different than, say, the US. Um, those companies are still, uh, there's still a lot of interest there. You're, well, and then Global is literally in the company name now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I do wonder, has, has the downturn affected your interest in companies beyond San Francisco, beyond the Bay? There's so much talk in recent years about, you know, do you even need to be here um, because of remote work, because uh, the VC industry has gotten so large? Mm -hmm. um, just, I'm curious. Any thoughts on? Are you are you bringing on more uh, global companies? Are you are you kind of focused more back on on the areas you know you know best, which perhaps would be nearby? Uh, no, definitely for us, like it, it doesn't change anything because we have been investing, you know, in Silicon Valley, but outside of Sil Silicon Valley since you know for the last 12 years before. There, were, there was much funding in any of these markets, so it definitely doesn't change. We are actually continuing to, to press forward in a lot of these different markets, both new to us or newer to us, and ones we have deep, deep roots in, like Southeast Asia. So we've been investing there since 2011. Um, uh, Latin America is, is quite active for us. Um, uh, Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Eastern Europe, et cetera. So it's, it's continued to be a focus, but I think because of the last couple of years, it did open up a lot more interest from investors to invest outside of Silicon Valley because there was really no, no choice. Everyone was doing Zoom and got comfort in doing diligence remotely. But I think now, both with the world coming back as well as everything going on, just a, a lot of, a, a lot of um, volatility, that risk is now being pulled back. 
where you know an emerging market for an investor in Sand Hill Road might have been seen as uh, it's it's, risk, it's higher risk for them. They just don't know, you know, they don't know Pakistan, they don't know Malaysia, they don't know Singapore. So um, because of that, it's no surprise a lot of investors are now pulling back because they see those markets as high risk. Um, sure. But you know, again, for us, our model is built around investing in markets all around the world, so it doesn't it doesn't stop us in any way. I want to I want to get to the accelerator and 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 what you know that decision making process for founders in a second. But I did want to ask just a little bit more about that. The um, do you, do you think just as the as far as the VC world in general, there is some pulling back. Perhaps some investors are sticking to what they know. Is there? It, I worry about what that means for diversity in in venture capital and and in the startup ecosystem. Just because, um, just sort of a, a sort of a a theory I have that if you if you were pulling back, you go back to what you know, and if you went to Stanford, you're going to maybe focus a little more on those people. Uh, it's, so I'm just curious, um, do you have any thoughts about diversity uh, in in this ecosystem going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that's definitely a concern because if if investors are pulling back from investing in emerging markets, it, generally they're they're pulling back into investing in what they know, and at least today. It, it, it's, it's still certain types of founders sometimes, their own networks maybe have not been super diverse. So um, that definitely is a concern. Um, I think the other issue is that for maybe for some of the, it's, maybe it's different for angel investors, but for uh, institutional venture firms, series A firms, you know, actual venture funds, Right now, they're likely not cutting as many new checks. They're taking longer due diligence. They're kind of, there's a lot of waiting and seeing, and they're investing that into their existing portfolio companies. So that does mean they're not cutting as many new relationships or new checks. And if their existing portfolios are not super diverse, then it's just the money's not going out into diverse founders. But, um, but I mean, one of the, you know, this, this change is, is, is slow. It takes a long time, unfortunately. I do think that what has been Maybe a silver lining in this is that there are a number of diverse managers that have launched their funds and continue to build their funds and um, really invest. And of course, it's not all on them to be doing doing that work. It really should be the entire industry. Um, but I, I'm excited to see many of them raise their next fund, um, raise larger funds. Um, so that has been exciting. But I do think that that's also it, it goes back to the what, what you're comfortable with and what you see as a risk. Unfortunately, that's a risk for some people, right. whether they want to admit it or not. But yeah, I pre yeah, I appreciate you speaking candidly about it. I, I think that's just a very important topic. But this gets right into the accelerator side because I think an aspect of what you're interested in or in doing with the accelerator is is bringing people into the fold. Um, it's not easy to break into these networks of VCs. Um, Sometimes it's not even easy to find an email address for a, a VC. I think it's gotten easier in recent years. But um, so, so one of the advantages of the accelerator program, which which is still a big part of 500, is is bringing people in. Like, do you have any? I'm just curious. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, when um, when should founders be considering an accelerator today? Mm. I I think there's there there definitely are still a, a lot of really strong benefits to being part of a an accelerator, or if a firm calls in an accelerator, just kind of like a seed, you know, like a founder program, because it it helps you get that um, mentorship or access in in um, in a way that's hence the name, like maybe more accelerated than if you were trying to go about it on your own. But I think one of the biggest things for us is that founders are able to connect with founders going through the same challenges, and that's something that is um, can be built on your own to some extent, but being able to j immediately just jump in and be immersed with other founders that are early stage, um, also trying to figure out how they you know, get to product market fit, testing out different things. Um, I think that's something that can be really um, life-changing actually for some companies. And in terms of when to apply, I mean, it's it really depends on where you are, what you're looking for. Um, you know, for some, if they're looking to, if they're thinking about raising or they do want to raise, um, you know, we love working with founders who are at that point where we can help guide them in terms of growth, um, running experiments, um, learning how to, to to pitch their business, and um, I, I, you know there are some programs that take companies pre-product or pre-idea. I don't know if you have pre-idea, but idea stage, and then there are some that want to have something to work with. So it really depends on which program. Um, we generally like to have companies that have have product, and you know they're in a position where we can 
help them figure out how to how to grow, how to build functional you know channels. Um, we have taken some companies that are earlier than that, maybe depending on the industry. Um, so you know, if, we also have had founders who've applied you know more than once if they just didn't make it the first time, and, and we've brought them in. So. Um, so it really it ultimately is like what is what is what is it that you're looking to build for your company? What are the milestones you're trying to hit? Hopefully, this program can help you get there faster. I, I, you, you more or less answered the, answered this question, but I wanted to ask. Let's say there are some founders out here who are interested in getting involved in an accelerator, but there are several. Well, there's I would say there are several like marquee accelerators. Uh, I would consider 500 part of that. I'd consider YC part of that, um, and then. Um, there are also so many important accelerators that are more, you know, I, for lack of a better word, uh, local. Um, so there are some in Los Angeles that aren't quite as well known but are interesting. I'm, I live in Los Angeles, so, you know, plugging my, my own weird town in the process there. But um, what, yeah, what, what how, do you, how do they choose? What would you advise someone if someone was like, hey, I'm looking into accelerators, but how do I choose which? I think the best way is to talk to other founders that have been through the program. So it's it's very you can look at the website, you can hear even you know our team talk about it, and, and it, it it can give you some sense. But I think that whenever we have founders who are wondering if it's a if it's a good fit for them or if it's actually useful, we try to put them in touch with other founders that have um, been through our batch because they can give them a much more candid answer if it helped them or not, and what 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 it had what they wish it had or what they you know whatever whatever was useful or not so i think um you know my my two cents is if you are considering different programs um it certainly doesn't hurt to just apply to them but if you're getting closer and trying to really evaluate because time is so precious as an early stage founder you just don't have much time and money but you just don't have a lot of time so um the best way to really get to that decision um is just talk with other founders that have been through those experiences and and see if it if it resonates with you and 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 go from there i i have a question here um uh regarding you know who to talk to uh when you're in the process of fundraising in a down market mm -hmm. um so it, you know we'll be jumping around a little bit that's the nature of the q a um and in a down market this person asked uh, should early stage companies be targeting angels or funds for their round um not quite sure i understand that but but th does it any thoughts on, on, on who should, who should uh, these perhaps first-time founders be talking to first? Um, I would definitely gear towards people who can, one, accessible, two, can make quicker decisions. Um, funds, depending on the fund, may or may not fall into that category. Um, but I think generally you should be building your investor pipeline target investors who do invest at that early stage. So let's say it's a first-time founder, I'm assuming um, there's not much there, it's kind of pre-seed or angel seed stage, then typically the investors that would back those types of rounds are angel investors. Um, there, again, there are some seed funds that back founders super early. There are accelerators that will participate. Um, so I would not go after Sequoia or Excel or anything like that, just because they, they typically don't back those types of rounds, except they, you know, many of them are now coming into the pre-seed space by launching things like Surge or um, ARC. Uh, there's a few programs like that for Sequoia. You know, Andreessen obviously just uh, has been doing some dabbling in the accelerator space. They announced something, I think, yesterday for, for crypto specifically. Um, but if you're, if you're trying to, say, it, pitch a firm that typically does Series A, Series B, I wouldn't spend too much time there. That's maybe more relationship building. But the ones that can write quicker checks, it's going to be the, the individuals. What, so on the relationship building note, has that changed? Has that process, does that look different now? Um, it, there's, it, are, are people really coming back together um, and, and doing things face to face and, and building their own networks that way? Are you, are you seeing a lot of discord groups um, for people still being very remote? I'm just curious as far as uh, part, of the, part of the advantage of being involved in an accelerator is you, you know, kind of being stuffed into a room with all of these interesting people, maybe not stuff, maybe, maybe it's nice and spacious, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like this room. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you, but, but do, you, do you think that face-to-face -face is really important? I, I think it is. I mean, I, although, you know, I will say that the last couple of years have shown that clearly remote work can, can be functional, but 
I do think now that every largely there's, I mean, this conference is happening. People, I, I've talked to several people who were just really excited to be here after two years of, of no travel. So there, there is, you cannot dismiss the in-person, of course. Um, and I've, I've talked to many of our own portfolio companies that have been trying to deliberate between the hybrid model, in-person, just staying remote. Um, I mean, for 500 as a firm, we've been distributed since the beginnings um, and have an office, so we've always been a bit hybrid as well. Right. And that, that can work, but um, I do think that it, it, you cannot rely on 100% Zoom, of course, or 100% remote. You, you are going to have to um, meet people in, in, in real life, especially, especially maybe key hires. Your, your own team, I think that's actually the biggest, bit, most important, your, your own uh, working team, your company. Certainly investors, um, you know, I think, again, you, you, you can get comfortable um, initiating or building a relationship um, remotely, but that's, that's only, you know, half of that, you know, half of it to be a really successful relationship. I'm seeing a lot of questions here about valuations from the audience. Um, so if you don't mind me jumping back a little bit. Um, how are seed, and this person asked, how are seed and early stage valuations uh, affected by the down market? Um, I'd imagine they go down uh, and, and, and they go back up and valuations can be kind of a slippery thing onto its own. But, but um, are you seeing, uh, you know, sort of, we sort of talked about this, but are you seeing, do valuations really look so different now? Because there's, there's so many different sides of, of, of this and there's a lot of doom and it's in, and you hear about um, you know all these uh, you know smart wealthy people uh, talking about oh, oh there's a recession we need to do this and that um, on the ground is it, do the valuations look different at the so at the early stage if, if the question is about you know like accelerator stage or precede um, pre-institutional round um, I mean, from my observations with the founders that we've been talking to or our own portfolio, there isn't a dramatic shift. It's nothing like, obviously, like Series A, Series B growth stage. Um, if there is a shift, it's maybe, it's, it's not, again, it's not significant, I think. Um, you know, it may be like a founder that was trying to raise at um, a 15 million cap. Now they're, they're, maybe they raise some there, but then they maybe it drops down to, to, to 13 or you know it's so in the grand scheme of things it's not a huge shift and I think that valuations wise um, again a lot of the the real impact is certainly at the later stage there's much bigger numbers that are being slashed sometimes in half um, or at the the some people call this late stage for it's generally still early stage but like right, the series right. a series B like there's definitely um, changes in terms of how investors value the companies whether it's on um, you know, it, like as an example, for a marketplace company, typically in, in good times, there may have been multiples on their GMV, but now GMV is, is not as, um, you know, not as ex exciting of a number. They may want to look at your actual revenue and counting that. And for a lot of marketplaces, that's a pretty low number. So, um, so the, the, the multiples are changing. Um, but that, I think, you know, you don't really think about that as a very early stage company. Um, but, you know, we've seen ranges of companies trying to raise from anywhere from you know, seven to, to 15, sometimes 20. 20 seems high nowadays. The, yeah, well, the, but the range is still very, very It is, it is wide, exactly, yeah. It was a very different world, even just 10 years ago, that yeah. those, those numbers look, I mean, it all sort of, it's almost difficult to keep track. Um, we got a, uh, several questions that just come in. Um, is it wise to go, to an, go into an accelerator after you've already raised pre-seed? Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any um, signal, like negative signal there. There's we, plenty of our founders have raised um, have raised some money, and then come be part of our program. So I think the valuation shift. I think it's not necessarily something that should be seen as a like. It's not. I wouldn't consider that the equivalent of taking a down round. It's really more that if you're going through. A certain program or accelerator, the terms are obviously the terms that they set, like standard terms. But it's really because, theoretically, they are you know these, the the accelerator is working very closely with you and adding a lot more in terms of resources than you know an angel investor would. So that's it's pretty I think standard and typical for all the programs out there. Um, so it's really again it's it's ultimately what what you're looking for. Um, but you know we've seen a lot of companies that have raised funding and have gone through our program. They've gone through other programs and. I nobody really. I mean, in my mind, nobody bats an eye. I think founders are concerned. It's going to. Um, it, it's a tough 
sell to their investors if the accelerator comes in at different terms. But usually, we, um, there are ways to, to navigate that. Uh, this is sort of an operational question for you. Um, oh, hold on, where to go? Where, you, where there you are? Um, I thought this was interesting. Have has uh, five hundred uh, has have have your uh, corporate <coughs> partners changed their behavior or strategic priorities lately? So, are your partners like you know still kind of you know in the trenches with you, um, pumped and and participating? Or are they sort of have you noticed the the corporate support and interest in in the early stage pulling back? Uh, I, um, if, if I'm hearing that question, if it's about corporates, just generally corporates in, in the ecosystem, it, it can vary, um, as well. Like there's definitely corporates out there that will pull back their spend on innovation or whatever it is. And I mean, just from our observation, um, they may have less, they, they may be less acquisitive than in the past. If they have some sort of CVC arm, maybe they don't invest as much. And then there are some that are actually continuing as planned. Um, it, maybe it depends on the industry that they're in um, or how they view their investment arm. So it, 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 it kind of, it varies. I think there are definitely corporates who, who need to invest into to startups and technology because their legacy business is not going anywhere. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's, it's uh, it, 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 like, if, if I can point to some of our later stage companies that have exited, um, you know, for some of them, they, they are, like like the the ones I've mentioned, they, they are also looking at their own cost structures, and they've had to go through. You know, um, they've seen it's been a little bit of a bloodbath for for a lot of of, of companies that have gone public, and as you know, in in, in certain sectors. But um, but I would say like it's it varies honestly. Like it's not like by and large all corporates are are pulling back from venture or anything like that. Sure, sure. Uh, so last question, we're just about out of time. I just wanted to ask. Um, What's your outlook for the next year in the startup world and, and it's, you know, for the world in general and then for, for 500 for the next year or two? Uh, so for the outlook for, for early stage for founders, um, you know, I, I think I, you know, I mentioned earlier that oftentimes the view is that uh, at the early stage, it's relatively immune or relatively decoupled from the macros. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't believe that anyone is, is completely immune, but for the most part, you know, starting a company um, you know, in those hard times, it can actually be a great thing just in terms of um, if you can get through that, then, you know, that's, that's, that's actually pretty exciting for, for the company. I mean, we, we look very positively on that. Um, but I do think that in terms of, is it, there's a probably very common question is, is it going to be harder to raise? Should I raise now? Should I raise next year? I, I can't tell you if it's going to be easier next year. Like, we, nobody knows. But I do think that um, if you can really focus on um, making sure that, how you position your company is, is um, you know, it, it shows like you really are solving a problem and, and, and you, you have the fundamentals. Investors are really gonna be looking for that a lot more closely, even at the earlier stages. Obviously, you don't expect you to be profitable as, as a very early stage company, but they do wanna see that that's more of a focus than just growth at all costs. Um, so I, I think that, you know, next year, it's probably gonna continue to be pain, but, um, I, I also think for early stage, especially for us as a venture firm, these are not you know, one year cycles, right? Funds are 10, 15 years. There's always gonna be some blips in, 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 or more than a blip in the market, geopolitical risks, like we can't control that. Sure, um, sure. But again, because we are playing for the long game, venture is not an in or out asset class, we're gonna continue to invest. And I think that's, that's the same long-term view founders should take as well. And you're feeling good about your portfolio, your investments, where you're where you're placing your bets now. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, because we we are very diversified in terms of sector, stage, and and geos. Like, there's there's very different. Um, there are very different trends and um, behaviors we're seeing in certainly in Silicon Valley, but in other markets around the world. So, um, com companies are going to continue to be founded and. There's still a lot of capital out there that is not exposed to venture or tech that wants to be. And so we're excited about that. Cool, cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and uh, in just a few moments, we, we got a break, and then we'll, we'll have another panel here. Uh, but thank you yeah. again. I really appreciate it. Thank you.